Hi everybody, welcome to the next lecture on basics of video technology. This time about video and image introduction in Python. Right. But first, some common Linux commands uh, for the terminal shell or the console. So let me just fix that. So here, so here. Um, since we all work on Linux um, and Python, um, a few command line are, um, commands are quite useful. So that's why I listed them here. So here this list first contains the command, like here, man, M-A-N, and then an explanation. So this command gives you the manual pages or an explanation for this command, which you have here. So for instance, try man, and then the next command would be CD. And then it says no manual entry. Okay, great. PWD. Okay, this is better. So if you don't really know exactly what this command is doing, you just type man and this command um, gives the explanation of um, the argument. So PWD means print name of current working directory. So that's quite helpful uh, to work on the terminal shell. So the next uh, very important one is CD for change directory. So if you're in the current directory, this allows you to go down into some subdirectory or up. So in this CD command, then slash means the root directory, the higher most, um, highest most directory, and uh, simply the point means uh, it it's uh, the current directory. And two points means go up on one directory. So for instance, cd space dot dot means you go up one directory. So let me go back to my little terminal shell here. I say q for quit for the man entry. Oh yeah, I should also mention you go down with a space bar. So here you can see more and you go up with a B button, B for backwards, and then Q for exit this uh, display mode. So then you can say CD space dot dot, and this lets you go up one directory. Now you can see here, it's no longer in Vorlesung, but it's one up. And then you can go down back into Vorlesung by just typing the name of the directory and then you're back. Right. And if you're not sure in which directory you are, you type PWD. So PWD, print working directory. And this gives us the working directory, the current directory we are in. So in this case, it's actually part of my prompt. So it's not really necessary, but it's not always showing up um, the current working directory in the prompt. So then it's quite useful. Yeah, so the next is PS for print running processes. So here you could type PS to see what's running in the background. And you can see it's basically this terminal window, the bash window, which is running and uh, the PS function itself, it's also running. Um, you can also see more um, like processes running on um, the computer by just saying PS minus EF, then you get the um, entire list of processes running on your computer. And that's useful, for instance, if um, a program got stuck and um, you want to kill it. Right? So usually you would say PS minus EF and then pipe it and say grab and then the process name, I don't know, maybe Python 3. And then you can see what's running in Python 3. And you guess you get process IDs here. This number is the process ID. And then you can say kill in this number and that it forces the end of this process. So that's good for um, programs that get stuck. Right. So this is what you, what I just showed you. 
here, wrap process name and then kill. So you would say kill and then this number kill space and then this number. Right. Then to see how much memory you have, you could use the DF and the DU. So DF is for disk free. So you can type it and then you can see a list of all your devices or um, your um, subdirectories and then you can see um, how much of the memory is used, how much is available and this is sometimes useful to check if, if you have sufficient memory um, to install a program. Or DU just looks at the current directory so disk usage here it shows how much memory is used for uh, in the current directory and you can also use minus h for human readable and this gives it gives it then in megabytes so here i have 76 megabytes in this directory then who am i that's um, sometimes useful to find out or remind you of your own username so who am i so here you can see that's my name. Um, yeah, that sometimes can be useful if, if you log into another machine and um, you're not quite sure which identity you're using. Then here you can also use finger username to get more information. Date shows you the current date. Time. So, um, Time is uh, useful, for instance, to measure how much time a program uses. So it measures the time of a command run, for instance, here, time ls. So then it does an ls and it also gives you the time duration that it used for this command. Yeah, then you have who shows you who is logged in. So it's just me. Uptime shows the time since the last boot. So that shows you how stable your system is running. So you know, here you can see it's 20 hours uptime. Then top is sometimes uh, good to check if a program grabs too much um, uh, system resources. So here you can see top and here you can see you have CPU usage, memory, and here you can see OBS, that's my video recording software, grabs most of the CPU's um, uh, cycles. So that's too expected. And here you can see further processes. And this also gives you the process ID, which again is useful for killing. So if you have, say, a program getting stuck, maybe you, may, you have a bug in your program and you have an infinite loop, and then you can check it this way, get the PID and then kill it. Yeah. So M MV is also quite useful. Move, it's for move, file name destination. So this is good to rename a file, for instance, or to move it into a different directory. Right? And this is actually quite fast because this move, even if you have, um, say, a directory, and you move it to a different location it's basically simply changing the name so it's not really copying everything it's just changing the name then rm is used to remove a file so rm file name removes this file so again space rm space file name mkdir make di uh, directory so mkdir space name of the new directory creates this directory then you have cat, C-A-T, for concatenate, which shows you the contents of a file on the terminal. And um, you know, let's see, we can try it. So ls star.py, let's see what we can take. So we can take, for instance, this one here, copy, and then you say cat, paste, and it, then it shows you the content of this file in your terminal. 
and you can also use it to pipe it into something else. So here, for instance, into grep or something. So pipe means the output of this command is used as input to the next command. Yeah, similar more, but this is good for longer files because um, it only shows one terminal window at a time. Right, so we could use now the same with more. More, and here you can see it first displays the first page and not everything fits on the first page. So here I can hit the space bar and then it displays the second page. And you can see the remain, remainder of this file. So this is also very practical. Yeah, X term starts another terminal. And usually I would use an ampersand at the end, which means it starts in the background and leaves this terminal usable for me. So here you can see it is starting a new terminal. Um, so since I'm not using any arguments here, it, ju it just uses the default for everything. Yeah. So then the next one is which. Sometimes that's also useful to find the path to a command. For instance, which which ls ls is a command, and you can see it is in user bin. So this is where you have all the Linux commands. Yeah, shutdown. Um, this is sometimes helpful to shut down your computer without using a um, the keyboard. Right. For instance, if you're logged in uh, from other some other machine and you don't have access to the keyboard, then you would use just shutdown. And you would need to use sudo, so that uh, your um, if you have super user privileges, you can do that. So shut down. Now it means now and not at a specific time. So I don't want to do that now. But um, you would also use something like sudo shutdown minus r for restart. You know, so this is, for instance, if you have a remote machine and you did some update and you need to do a restart. Yeah, then you also have VI, the visual editor, uh, which is also terminal based. So also very practical for uh, remote logging in. So this remote login you might uh, need, for instance, for high compute intensive um, um, programs like machine learning. You log in and uh, you only have the terminal window. No access to the keyboard and no graphics access. So then this editor VI is very useful. So you would say VI and then say test.txt. That's the file name. And you would hit return. And you can see actually it already exists. So here you have toilminal. And um, this is actually the command mode. And then you can type escape. No escape, you come into the command mode. And then in command mode, you can enter colon um, write for writing it. Um, I for insert. So let's see. I insert, yeah. So here you cannot really use the arrow keys and that's why you get, um, um, see that it looks a little bit funny. So for VI, you really have to know the commands here. So let me just quit. So colon Q, oh, first I need to enter escape, colon, Q and then it exits. Yeah. So exclamation mark, clone, exclamation mark, Q, quit. Yeah. Oh no. So what does it 
let's say press enter to, to or type command to continue. Mm -hmm. Q. Hmm, interesting. It's not really working. Escape. Colon. Q. Huh. Escape. Colon. Right. Colon. Q. Ah, now it worked. Yeah, you can see I'm also not very familiar with VI um, because I'm usually use gedit. And uh, gedit I found quite convenient, or also xemax, uh, which also has a terminal output mode. So VI, you really need to know the commands. So I just en uh, mentioned the SSH, the secure shell. This is how you would um, um, remote log into a different machine. So you would say SSH, and then some machine dot tu ilminal for instance right and then you can log into this other machine and then um, instead of having your um, terminal um, shell on your own machine your terminal shell will then be connected to this remote machine and execute the commands and also display everything that this remote machine answers so that's very convenient. So you can also say man SSH. Yeah. So you actually have plenty of options. Q. Yeah. Copy is very useful. Copy is very similar to MV for move, but here it produces a copy. So it's not changing, but it copies a file or directory. Um, for instance, it takes a file and copies it to another file with a different name. Right. So this is, for instance, if you want to modify a file but also want to keep the old one. Then SCP for secure copy. This allows you to um, copy files between network machines. So SCP, for instance, SCP dot which means everything from the current directory to user at remote machine dot edu to that directory so dear is then the name your desired name for that directory on that machine right so that allows you to use the command line to move and copy or copy files between machines yeah ch mod means change mode so this is useful, for instance, if you have a Python code, a Python program as a text file, and you want to make this text file executable. Then we, you would use chmod user group plus x, and then this file name, for instance, your Python file. And then you can actually execute this Python file from the desktop, desktop by double clicking on it. Yeah, then IF config. This shows network data like the IP address of your machine. Right, so here IF config shows all the connection data of your machine, which is um, sometimes useful for remote access. For instance, here you can see the IP address, and then you can use this IP address on another machine to SSH into this machine. So you could use SSH uh, and then this IP address to log into my machine here. Um, but this is actually a local address, so this only works in this in my local network here. Yeah, then also useful is SOX, the audio tool um, library. Uh, you would install it with sudo apt install socks right here you have the password and then it installs and here you can see it's already installed so nothing needs to be installed here and this 
um, contains, for instance, the command play. So when you type play and then some WAR file, then it would play this WAR file to the speaker on your computer. All right. So that's also quite useful. Then wget um, allows you to uh, obtain an entire website tree um, to your local machine. So here you would um, enter some website and then it actually um, contacts the server and then downloads the entire website to your computer. So uh, sometimes that's useful. Okay. So these are probably the main commands that you need on the command line for the terminal shell. And debugging is an essential part of programming, right? So when you do um, your program writing, often it's quite quick to, uh, to write the first version of your program, but then you will notice it's not working. So that's when you start debugging. So you need to be careful reading all the error message uh, to have a guess uh, what's wrong. So an essential strategy for this is to divide the program into several simple functions with known input-output relationship and then test them separately. So smaller programs are easier to debug than large programs. So that's why it's good to have large programs as a collection of simpler programs, which are the functions. And then you can more easily test the simpler functions. Yeah, so in the console window, the terminal shell, uh, we need to install Python OpenCV, if not already done, for our uh, access to the video camera. So um, Python actually traditionally has two versions, Python 2 and Python 3. Python 2 was stopped to be supported at the beginning of this year, so we should all now work with Python 3. So if two versions are present, then you can distinguish them here with Python 3, which I do here. Yeah, so we can simply install our OpenCV, so that means computer vision library, on our computer by executing this command. Right, so it's one of the big advantages of Linux. It's really easy to install packages or modules here. So this is my terminal shell. I just hit return and then you can see it identifies it, but it says it's already there. So that's fine. Yeah, and to use it, for instance, we can then go to the interactive mode of Python. And for Python, we can also use IPython uh, minus PyLab. So that's actually convenient. Um, IPython, IPython gives you a little bit more convenient um, interactive shell. And minus pilot means it already imports uh, the mathematics and plotting functions. And IPython is something you also have to install. So if it's not already on your machine, you would also use sudo ept install IPython, I think IPython 3. Let's see if that works. Yes. So here you can see it's already installed. Um, if it's uh, not installed on your machine, you can simply use this command here to install it on your machine. And then you type IPython, Python 3 minus PyLab to get into interactive mode. So here you can now see this colorful prompt tells you that you're now um, in interactive mode of IPython 3. Uh, so now it expects Python commands and no longer Linux commands. Right? For instance, 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6. Right? So it in interprets it. So now we can also use this interactive mode to import CV2. So this is actually a submodule of OpenCV and it contains um, functions to access the webcam on your system. So now it imported it, no error function or no error message, so that's good. So 
yeah, the help function is also quite useful. For instance, help, let's see what it says with CV2. Yeah, so here, Python wrapper for OpenCV, so Open Computer Vision. And here you can see sub module that are available for you to use. So here it's actually quite a lot. Then you have different functions, classes. Here with space, I go from one page to the next one. And it get, actually gives you quite a lot of information here. Q lets me end it. Yeah, so CV2 then um, gives us useful commands. For instance, CV2 imread. This is for reading JPEG images from a file, right? So if we have in this current directory, a yeah, in this current directory at, at which I started this IPython interactive shell, so here in this directory, if we have um, JPEG images, we can use the function imread to read it into our um, terminal shell interactive uh, mode. Similar imwrite allows us to write JPEG images to, into a file. Then imshow allows us to display uh, an image. So this plots images from arrays, from NumPy arrays, from Python NumPy arrays. Yeah, and um, imshow is also a function with the same name in matplotlib pyplot. So there's a potential name conflict. And that's why it's important to have the module name here in front of it. So here we say cv2.imshow. And then there's also a matplotlib pyplot imshow. So if we abbreviate matplotlib pyplot as plt, then this would be plt.imshow. So that's why it's important to have those names of libraries or modules. Yeah, so we can use this um, library to, for instance, take a photo. So let me exit, quit here, quit. And then we can take a look at this Python function copy. And now I'm taking gedit, my favorite editor, which is actually coming standard in Ubuntu. Image rec disp. So here you can see the content of this program. Right? And you can see here in the beginning, it imports CV2 as we just did in the interactive mode. Right. But then it continues with cap equals CV2 video capture zero. So this takes the first camera in the system. And then cap is an object which is connected to this camera. Here I can set the resolution. So here's the horizontal resolution, the vertical resolution, because my camera has a very high resolution. I want to reduce it. Here I'm actually taking reading a frame. So taking a picture of it. So cap read um, immediately access this, accesses the camera and returns the content in the array frame. And red is a binary value, true or false. And it's true when the read was successful. And then next, it simply displays the captured image using imshow. And then it also writes it to this file using imwrite so this to this file pycolorphoto.jpg and it writes from the array frame yeah then i display uh, then i just keep it open basically keep this um, im show open until i hit the key q so here's an infinite loop which keeps this um, program running until i hit the key q so here basically every millisecond it asks what key do i press then it applies this uh, template of eight ones. And if this templates re template, those first eight bits have the ASCII code of lowercase q, then it finishes. And then it releases the camera and the window. So let me just try it. So here we can say Python 
three image rec disp dot py. So now you can see I'm using the command Python three with an, with an argument, right? If I would just hit return without an argument, I would go um, back into interactive mode. But now specify an argument. It is not going into this interactive mode, but executes this file and that and then finishes. So we can see that. So here I'm executing it. So here is now the picture, right? And now I can hit the key Q and then it finishes it, right? And then we can take a look at uh, the produced picture. So here's the file name, copy, and then we can say I of GNOME. So I'm now using a, um, my Linux command EOG, which displays um, image files. And here we can see it's indeed there, right? And we can also see the size, ls, and if I specify minus l, it gives me more information, minus L, like long, minus long. So and then it shows us that we have like 100 kilobytes. So it's actually rather small. We can also say minus LH for human readable. So then we can see 107 kilobytes. Right, so that worked. Yeah, we could also use Python for it. So if we, instead of um, want to use um, the Linux um, command, we can just go back into Python. And let's see, or write a program. So in Python, we simply again import CV2. And then we use imread to read this um, file. And we can also see the size of the image with shape. So here photo dimension is photo.shape. So here this is what Imred, Imread was reading in. And here we can see the dimensions. So, so actually I have uh, some somewhat higher dimensions. And let's try that out. So now I'm saying Python 3 without the I. So this is the simplified interface, but I'm still back into the interactive mode. So now I'm saying import cv2 and now photo equals imread copy and paste so now i have photo and now we can say photo dot shape yeah and here you can see it we have 576 rows 1024 columns and three primary colors because this is a color image. So that's why we have the third dimension where we have three entries for red, green, and blue. Right, yeah. So this is what we have here. So the three comes from the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Um, also note that Python OpenCV stores it in order BGR, blue, green, red. So that means that the last index of shape zero is blue, one is green, and two is red. Yeah, so that's kind of um, counterintuitive because usually it's RGB, but here it's um, BGR. So maybe I can just shorten it no. that should be clear enough so here we can also have access to individual pixels for instance the pixel position 0 0 has the proportion of the primary color um, blue from this entry so we have pixel number 0 0 and then here the blue component and here I had 88. Let's see what we have here. So photo 0, 0, 0. Here I have 48, right? 
And this is gen in general a number between 0 and 255 because uh, it's 8-bit unsigned integer. You know, 8 bits unsigned integer per primary color. So and um, it's an intensity value, and that's why it's unsigned, right? Because we don't have negative intensities. Yeah, we can also represent the image in the matrix or tensor photo. So it's actually a tensor because it's three-dimensional. For black and white, it would be a matrix. So then we can use CV2, right, for displaying it. CV2 im show. So I can just paste. So now it takes the array photo and displays it in a window with the name photo on top of it. So and to display the image, so you can see no photo yet, but to display it, we need the weight key. So that's kind of like a hidden function of this weight key um, because it's not just waiting for the keyboard import input, but it also opens the window, right? So here, now we see it and it stays open for a thousand milliseconds, I guess. Hmm. Okay, so it's not really finishing. Don't know, this should be one second basically, but it's taking longer, I guess. Oh, maybe because I didn't hit a key. Oh, yeah, that actually killed my Python 3. Yeah, so this thousand means um, the image is displayed for a thousand milliseconds and then the key press from the keyboard is queried. So probably I should have hit a key from the keyboard. Yeah, so the following shows the display of the blue component intensity value of the image. So we can now use this to just display the blue component. So let me go back to my Python 3 and then I can use the up arrow to get my previous commands, uh, at least I thought so. Okay, so let me copy and paste it. Copy, paste. Then we have imshow and we need to read it in, copy. Read. So now we have it back and now we can just show the blue component here. So we obtain the blue component by in settings, instead specifying indices for the rows and columns, we just specify colons, which means all possible values in this index, index range. So paste. So that means here we have all possible indices and for the last one we just take the zero, the blue component. So again, wait key, copy and paste. So here you can now see all the blue um, values. And you can see my shirt is bluish, so that why it appears bright but then anything more reddish would appear darker. Right. So let me finish this keyboard entry. Still not working. Interesting. Yeah, here we have the shell back, but the picture is still open. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so this shows us the blue component. So basically everything after our blue filter in the camera. Yeah, so now we can extend it also to video processing, which means we process more than just one image. We just take an image like every 20th of a second. And the OpenCV library gives us this possibility to stream data directly from a webcam in a computer or also with a Raspberry Pi. And for this purpose, the command is cap equals CV2 video capture, right? So here we have not imread from a file, uh, but video capture, basically like um, as we did for taking the photo, right? So here we take video capture, 
copy, paste. So now this is connected to the video camera. And here we can then take a photo or a frame from the camera, paste. So now we have something in the frame, right? So frame dot shape. And you can see it's actually this uh, frame of this shape, right? So similar to what we did with the photo before. And now we can actually display what we just took using imshow again. So here now directly takes the shape, uh, the frame and displays it in a, a window with the name frame on top of it. So here you can see it. And then we again need the wait key. I hope that works because the other frame is still open. So let's try this. Yeah, blue component. Huh. Yeah, I guess I have to kill it. And then also it killed my Python 3. For some reason it doesn't really work the, uh, the way it should. So let's try it again. Import CV2. And then cap2 video capture. Paste. So now we did the video capture. No, we display it and now we show it. Hmm, interesting. Oh, I forgot to take the frame, right? So I actually need to take read the frame using this line here. Paste. Okay, so now display it and now we have it. Yes, very high resolution. And of course, it's not closing, unfortunately, but that's okay. It shows you how it works. So this also shows why I reduced the size of the um, of the resolution before because my camera has a way too high resolution so I need to reduce it. Yeah. Right. So here wait key waits for the key event which didn't really work here. Yeah. Okay, force quit. Yeah, so it works better when you do it in a, in a program like this one here. So this is actually now a program which captures and displays a video, which means um, one frame after the other. So basically it's doing the same thing as we just did for a single frame. First it's set up the camera, here camera number zero. And then we have this infinite loop while true. So that means each time the loop reaches this part, it reads a frame from the camera. And then next it shows, it displays this frame on the window. Right, and basically now it continues until we um, hit the key Q. So here we have if wait key, and here we just wait one millisecond. Right, here we have our template of eight ones. So if what if the, those eight ones contain the ASCII code of lowercase q, the key that I just hit, then we break out of this infinite loop. So basically this infinite loop is continued as long as I don't hit this key q. And here this one milliseconds means it just waits for one millisecond and then it continues with this while loop. And that means in principle and theory we should get 1000 frames per second, right? But of course my camera is not fast enough. 
maybe this camera can do 20 or 30 frames per second so this will be all uh, we can get and it's basically this limit comes here in this cap read right this reading from the camera takes some time and that's why we don't get um, this high frame rate yeah so i put this in this file here we can take a look at this file using gedit and here you can see what we just saw basically my infinite loop here it reads the frame here it displays the frame and then it waits for a millisecond and um, now we can also use Python, but of course it will be a way to high resolution. Python 3. So now it starts the camera. And indeed, a way to high resolution. So now I push Q, key Q, and it finishes. So here the key Q worked. Yeah. Here is a program to capture a photo again using this uh, video. So here first we have this video capture, captures a frame, reads in a frame, and then it writes it to this file, which we basically just saw only now put in this, in this file, image rec disp. Right. Yeah, this is then to display um, part of um, the picture. Here you can see it reads from the camera and just displays the upper left hand pixel. Right, so we can try it. So this basically shows us the values, the intensity values, Python 3. Yeah, so here you can see it. Here we have blue, green, red, and you can see here red was the highest, then green was a little bit lower, and blue was also a little bit lower again. Right, and this also depends. So next time I take it, we have a different value. Yeah, so here now we have slightly different values, and this is always uh, the pixel on the upper left hand corner. Also, um, maybe I should show you the video rec disp with a limiting of the size. G edit. Simple. Yeah. So here you can see my reduction of the size that I put into this version of my video display. And um, yeah, and in this way we get a more useful image size, which also has the advantage that it has a higher frame rate because the transmission of the higher resolution takes longer. And that's why we get a lower frame rate. So here you can see I have indeed a higher frame rate. You can see my movement is more fluent. Yeah. Right, so here we address the pixel position. So here those were given. And the last one was the colon, which means uh, uh, the entire index range, which means we get those three values for blue, green, and red. Again, unsigned integer eight bits. Yeah, and that's in this case the same as zero colon three. That means we have all indices starting from zero going up to but excluding the three. So we get zero, one, two, right? So three is just not included. And in this case, those two are identical, right? Yeah, so as output, we not only get a value, but an array with the values of the three primary colors um, in the order BGR, right? 
So here we saw we have those different values and depending on what you just capture, you have different values. And u and 8 means unsigned integer, 8 bits. And with 8 bits, you have 256 possibilities. And that means you get values between 0 and 255. Yeah, and here with this following program, we actually can analyze the R, G, and B components as video in separate win windows. So here I use the same capture as before, but now I'm not only displaying the original, but, only, but also the B, G, R components, the blue, green, and red in different windows, which I'm creating here. So here's the infinite loop. And here you can see I'm displaying the blue with the index zero here in the end, the green with the index one, and the red with the index two. All three of them on top of the original. And the rest is the same as before. So we can now execute it. Copy Python three paste file name. And now we get, yeah, maybe this is a little bit too big. So let me take the trick from our previous window. So let me set the resolution here. Copy and then edit this one here. So I open this with gedit and just after this cap command, I define this, uh, the resolution, reduce the resolution and then run it again. So yeah, so this looks more manageable. So here you can see the original, right, color. And this con uh, consists basically of three videos. One video where you have the red filter in front of it. So everything which is red appears brighter, for instance, here my face, but not my shirt, which is blue, right? Then we have the green. So everything which is green appears brighter. So you can see my face is already a little darker because it's not green. Uh, my shirt becomes brighter because it's um, also appearing somewhat in the uh, in the blue component. But here then in the blue component, my shirt will be brightest because it is blue, right? And I also have, say, you can put some greenish in front of it. So here you have, you can see a green package with a blue label. And in the red component, you can see the white appears bright, but then this blue is really like black, right? And the green is like medium. But then here in the blue component, here this appears much more intense, right? Compared, here is the red component, here is the blue component. So this is more, has more brightness because it's blue. So in this way, we have different um, strengths here we have the green, you can see here the package, the green package appears brightest in the, in the green component. So the different component intensities then result in the different colors. Right. I can also try this one here. Here, my technology review, you can see here the red label and here the blue sign. So the red label here appears brightest in the red channel. So it's as bright so that even the, the, uh, the font is, is harder to read when you compare it here. In the green, it's already almost black and in the blue the same. But then here in the blue, um, blue channel, this uh, blue um, sign appears brightest and then it's almost black here in the red channel. So that shows the effect of those color filters. Basically, those um, the relationship between the brightness of those three determines the color that we will see. And 
basically my display is doing the same thing. It displays uh, those different intensities with different colors and then our brain um, makes different color mixtures out of it. So it's basically um, a property of our brain that it gives us different mixture colors. Yeah. So this is what we just saw. And yeah. So each pixel requires an information content of three bytes, meaning one for each um, primary color and one byte is 8-bit. So we have 480 times 640 pixel. For instance, I had more. So this would be a smaller version and this is already 300,000 pixels per frame. If you have 25 frames per second, we get about 307,200 times 25 times 3 times 8 bits per second, right? Even for a smaller color video. And this results in about 184 megabits per second. So that's a lot, right? This is more than you would get um, even with fast um, DSL connections. So this is significantly more than most internet connections offer, let alone for wireless transmission. So that's why we need compression, right? We should think of a wireless transmission, uh, how we reduce the necessary bit rate. Yeah, let's say four how we can reduce the bit and bit rate. So a simple method is to transfer only or transmit. Let's call me transmit. Only black and white video content instead of color content, which brings in the reduction by a factor of three. Let's call it brings a reduction bit rate by a factor of three already, right? So this, uh, this is also a reason why in the beginning we only had black and white TV. In order to produce the correct brightness impression, we must take into account the relative different sensitivity of the human eye um, to the three basic colors or primary colors. Call this primary colors. By empirical examination of the subjective brightness, the following relation was obtained for the primary colors RGB. So this is the relative sensitivities of the eye. So the eye is most sensitive to G, least sensitive to blue, because this is the lowest, um, smallest factor, and medium for red. So this is like a medium factor and you can actually um, see that the sum of all those um, is one. So these are the relative factors for our um, brightness perception. So if you have a color camera, then we need to multiply those three primary color components with these factors, add them up to obtain a brightness impression that our eye would get. Yeah, so we see the eye is most sensitive to the primary color green, followed by red and significantly less to blue. So if you weigh the primary color values of our video, we get a matching black and white image. And this is uh, the computation. Its brightness value is denoted by Y, and this is how we obtain it. We just multiply the primary colors by the corresponding sensitivity factors for the eye. Right, and yeah, this is what I just mentioned. Um, the sum of those three factors is equal to one, and that also means that Y has the same range of values as R, G, and B. So if R, G, and B is between zero and 255, then so is Y. Yeah, so here's a Python example to compute the so-called luminance component Y. So we call Y luminance. The brightness or the black-white version of the image is computed here. For comparison, again, the green component can also be re um, reproduced. Um, so the green has already the largest factor here. So the green component alone 
uh, should look quite similar to y. And this is a trick I often will use for convenience. So copy for comparison the green component is also displayed. Displayed. Yes. So now let's take a look at that file. G edit. Here you can see the content. So it's our usual beginning and um, I should use this limitation of the size right in the beginning. So after video capture. And then here you can see I do the capture of a frame, but now I'm computing the Y component and here you can see it. So here 0.144, the factor for blue goes for index zero, which is for blue. Then here the green component factor and here the red component factor. And since these are float numbers, I will also normalize it to the range between zero and one. And this is important because y now is a float number instead of unsigned int eight, right? And if we have a float number, um, we can still use imshow to display it, but then imshow expects a value range between zero and one, right? So this is something you have to know. If it's u and eight, um, then you can use the usual um, value range between zero and 255. But if it's float, then it expects a value range between zero and one. That's why I have this normalization here. Yeah, and here's the green frame as comparison, here index one. And here I display the two. Here I'm displaying Y and here I'm displaying G. And here you can also see that this computation is very convenient because I apply this factor to every pixel of this um, blue frame, right? We have all those pixels and every pixel is multiplied by this factor. So that's very convenient for um, programming an advantage of Python. So now I can execute it. Python 3. opens the camera and here we go. So here we have the original again. And then here we have the luminance. So I think this actually gives a quite good impression of, impression of the brightness, right? It's not like unnatural, it's actually giving quite natural brightness impression. And now compare this with just green. And you can see slight differences. For instance, here my face is slightly darker, but then the rest is almost the same. So it's only slight differences. And if you wouldn't see those two um, in, in comparison, you pro probably wouldn't care tell, uh, you probably couldn't tell if it's green or Y. So that's why I often use this trick of instead using Y, I'm just using the green component, which is the strongest anyway. Okay. Yeah. So this is what you just mentioned. We can multiply a frame by a float value. Yeah, so we see Y best produces the human brightness impression, but green comes close. Yeah, but black and white is not very satisfactory. So how can we transfer a color with a relative low bit rate? How many pixels do we need for a good quality display? So of a, of, yeah, of a color image. To answer these questions, we must now take a look at the properties of the eye, right? And that actually comes next time. So for now, that's it. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next video.